the Jillian Eve channel, and I have a very special guest with me today, with us, I should say, because we're all here together. This is Abby Frankmont. She is the author of Respect the Spindle, and she's joining us for a very, very special live chat. And if you're watching this in the recording, a welcome and hello to all of you in the replay crew. That's what the kids say, right? The replay crew. <laughs> Feel free to leave comments. And we will read the comments and um, see what you'd like to add to our conversation. Welcome to do that. So I would like to uh, just welcome Abby. Abby, why don't you start and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you. First of all, thanks so much for having me here. And Evie, it has been so much fun talking about and planning this trip that we're going to do. And I know we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, but I guess first I will introduce myself a little bit so that people have some vague idea who I am other than just the author of Respect the Spindle. Um, like that should be enough, right? Like that's interesting enough. Um, no, but seriously. Um, so I grew up here in Peru in the Cusco area um, in a town called Chinchero, which is now half an hour outside of Cusco because they've built paved roads and all of this kind of stuff. But back when I grew up there, it was three or four hours from Cusco and very, very rural and all of that kind of stuff. And so that's where I learned to spin and weave growing up from, you know, the pre-K toddler years on into the teenage finishing high school years and so forth. And I have spent all my life back and forth um, between the USA and Peru. And then I moved back here permanently in 2018, so it's been five years now, uh, to, to live here and do my thing. And what is my thing? Well, I do a lot of education about textile topics and Peru is a hotbed of textile activity and has been for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but I also sometimes bring people here to experience that stuff in person. And uh, I just, I really, really love sharing Peru with people. Um, you can check out some stuff on my YouTube channel if you're, if you're, if you're bored or if you want to know more about me and stuff as well uh, and all of that. So I speak English, Spanish, and Quechua. Quechua is the language that the indigenous um, Peruvians in the Cusco area speak. It was the language of the Incas. And, um, you know, I have been spinning and weaving in the Andean tradition since I was a small child. Uh, my parents were researchers on traditional Andean textile techniques. And so that was, that was uh, why we lived here growing up. Um, and, you know, some other things that they did that were Andean studies related and whatnot. So uh, anyway, like I say, now what I do is live here and enjoy all the amazing landscape and scenery and incredible food and, you know, maybe just a little bit of yarn stuff, too. <laughs> and, a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. And Peru is really interesting for a lot of reasons when it comes to textile topics. And among them are that many of the traditional communities continue to wear their traditional garb, their traditional um, attire. And uh, it is you know, a form of communication where it lets people know where they're from. It's an identity kind of textile thing. And there's a whole lot of interesting stuff like that. And so I totally, for this, put on my identity textile, which is the team shirt from the uh, the Abby's Yarns football club team, which uh, did not win the championship this year, but we did last year. So that was pretty cool. So you know. anyway, um, so that is, that is basically... Um, I think, uh, an, an introduction to me. Uh, oh, and I have this amazing space to host people in where I have a beautiful garden and private rooms with, uh, with private baths that have super hot, high pressure water in the showers, which is actually kind of rare in the Cusco area. And they're, they're like really good even by international standards and everything. So that's like really nice if you've had a long day. Um, and we do amazing food stuff. And because my team prepares all the food for the most part, unless we're going to specific restaurants for specific events, but because we prepare all the food, you know, we can accommodate all, all your food needs. And we actually know what we're doing on that, on, on that front. And, uh, and, uh, Ollantaytambo, which is where, uh, which is where my main facility is, is the town, um, at the downstream end of what they call the sacred Valley of the Incas. 
and it's where people usually catch the train to go to Machu Picchu. So it's really, it's really neat. And it is also known as the Living Inca City, because it is a Living Inca City. And it is the longest continuously inhabited town in the Americas, in the New World, um, or human settlement or whatever. And people have been living there for that they know of based on the archaeological record without stopping and moving someplace else or whatever. I mean, I guess it's like not the same people, but for like 3,500 years. So, and probably more than that, because it's a, there's, there's a lot there. So it's really, it's really an amazing town Um, because everybody, everybody really stays true to identity and history and culture. And there's so much amazing stuff to do, but you're still never, uh, never more than about a quarter mile walk from like having a cappuccino or uh, emergency medical care or things that you might need. And like so. coffee is really good there, isn't it? I'm looking forward it, to it, the coffee. It's, <laughs> um, it's, it's local coffee. So it is also grown just down river, like a little bit past, like if you go down the river a little bit past Machu Picchu, you get into what they call the, the edge of the, the edge of the jungle. It, it's, um, you know, it's rainforest and that is kind of the best area to grow coffee because it's, it's still at some altitude, but it's, we got these great growing conditions and stuff. So, yeah, so so we all drink local coffee. And, like, everybody who's from that neck of the woods has these strong opinions about how they're supposed to roast coffee. And they roast it at home, you know, and people are like, no, you shouldn't add sugar to it when you're roasting it and make it look all dark and oily. That's just cheating, and it makes it not as good. You have to, like, roast it really right, and it should look just this color, and the smell that's coming off it is like this. So like time permitting, depending on stuff, like one of our alternative activities that we have, because we've planned this amazing trip and we have backup and alternative things in case anything happens like a weather event, which is not really likely in October. Um, But you never know, it could happen. Like it could be like super duper rainy and we don't want to go hike through some ruins that day. Um, um, but so we, one of the activities that we have as sort of a backup thing is roasting your own coffee and cacao. Oh my goodness. That sounds amazing. Wow. So thank you for that awesome introduction. And I'm also going to encourage anybody who's curious about these areas. Like we have the benefit of the internet. There's so many pictures and things you can go and check out and just get kind of an idea of what we're talking about. Um, And so we're going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit because we're going to talk just some general questions and spinning things and uh, make that something that we can all do together while we're hanging out and chatting. And I'm also going to talk about this trip that Abby and I have been planning. So I am going to be going to Peru in October, 2024. And we have spots for people to come and join us. And so that is our big, exciting thing. I have been sort of teasing it. I've I've let my patrons know. And now this is like the internet knows. (laughs) Uh, So we have this. Yay. (laughs) Um, So we have this awesome trip planned. If you want more details, I pinned a link to a public Patreon post. And so you can go and see some of the details there, some of the things that we're going to be doing. So if you have questions about that, we will take those questions. If you have spinning questions, we will take those too. But Abby, I wanted to start with something because, you know, I kind of, I, I kind of dabble in and out a little bit of sort of like the reenactment and historical uh, reproduction kind of spaces with the spinning and weaving and things I do. And one of the things that we talk about so much with that is how, you know, we, we look at a skill that's like challenging or difficult that we're trying to figure out. We talk about how like, well, you know, back then, whenever, wherever that was that we're referencing, people would have learned it just from having a community around them doing those things. They would have grown up with it. They would have seen it. They would have experienced it on a level that us as hobbyists never could or can or do. So you have a very different experience with that. So I'd love for you to share a little bit. Sure. I mean, it is is really interesting because like one of the things to to sort of know about, about textile topics in particular, and this is everything involving you know yarn and thread and fiber arts and the making of clothing and other things that are textile stuff so that's like upholstery 
it's utility textiles, it's all of this kind of stuff. Um, it, it was sort of the, I, I mean, I guess you could call it like the canary in the coal mine of the industrial revolution, right? So it's, it's what went first, right? And it's what had to be sort of uh, uh, offloaded to being mechanized and industrialized. And industrialized means that now it's done in, in like factory type settings and it's a market product that is mass produced instead of being something that people do at home uh, or in small scale industries that are like local to your town or a lot of things like that, right? And so there was a lot of social engineering that went along with that. And that included like in the UK, resettling people from communities that they had lived in since the Bronze Age to be uh, now living in settlements around factories that were built by early uh, industrialist capitalist you know, venture capitalist type people who had the money to build factories and machinery and all that kind of stuff. And those people who were resettled from her base, right? So there's this whole life shift where instead of making the things that you need or having people in your community make the things that you need or having these sort of general skills. Now the industrialized life shifts you towards having to buy those objects or, uh, or pay for the services that are involved with all of that kind of stuff. And now there's, there are pros and cons, right. And all of that kind of thing. Um, but so what ends up happening is the more generations distant you get from living that more agrarian agricultural type life and small town life and more into an industrialized life where you're purchasing everything, where you work for money that you then turn around and spend on the necessities of day-to-day -day life, uh, including your textiles. Um, you know, the more distant that we get from that, the less the skills to lead that kind of life are commonplace. Right. So we have other sets of skills to, you know, hold a day job in 2023 that you wouldn't have in an agricultural agrarian type life. And um, so anyway, what's interesting about this is that the whole world is actually still in the process of industrialization. Right. Like it's still it's still going through this whole process. It hasn't like run its entire course quite yet. There's still a ways to go. Um, and how industrialized and how developed and how you know, mercantilized a given area is kind of depends on where in the world it is. And so now when we look at areas like what we call the, the global south, which is where a lot of factories and stuff like that are, um, that is where a lot of the production is still done. So you still have a lot of people who can do a lot of these textile type uh, things, um, but they're doing them working in factories. So you have people working, sewing in, uh, in, garment districts and stuff like that. And uh, in Peru, on the whole, as a country, is still today um, a real powerhouse of textile production. And it does a lot of garment production uh, for the global market. So it's really interesting because you can also go and see where a lot of these things are done. You can go to the garment district in um, a part of Lima and see modern stuff being done, but also still out in the agricultural communities there's still the really traditional textile production. So there's this meld of these things and you've got people who enjoy doing that kind of thing and they're never going to give it up. So they are still hobbyists, even though they are knitting every single sweater that their family is going to wear. And you have people who are knitting for market and selling like at the farmer's market, like baby sweaters that they've knit or what have you, or they will knit to order. Um, you can, you can go into any market across the street and get alterations made to clothes that you buy and um i mean like any market and uh you know there's just there's just so much of all this kind of stuff going on but when i was a kid uh i was growing up in the, uh, this town called chinchero and it uh specifically it specifically has as a major identity thing having been a spinning and weaving community since inca times and even before so Everybody in Chinchero learns how to do some spinning and weaving and other general yarn work, making ropes, uh, a lot of things like that. And um, and that that was the case, you know, in the 1970s, 1980s, way back in the 20th century. Um, 
when, when I grew up there. And it meant that everybody was sort of doing all of those things all the time. And you did just learn it in a household and like going out to play sort of context. Um, it's, it's different now because everybody goes to school, which wasn't necessarily an option back in the seventies. It was beginning to become an option. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> But now people who want to learn those things aren't necessarily starting to be as intensely focused on it at the age of like four or five years old. They might be, you know, they're old enough that they can go to like a Saturday event outside of school hours um, and do things in that kind of context. But they still learn stuff with a lot of support in the home. So It's so interesting to just uh, see the different ways, because as a teacher, I, I am a professional educator. And in college, you know, of course, I learned all of the different developmental milestones and, and how we grow and learn things. And and children who play, it, it's just the most natural way to gain those skills. It's, mm -hmm. it's just really cool. And that can be challenging as adults who are trying to learn to spin. And I always want to be encouraging to people, don't give up, keep trying. But it can be frustrating to come to something where it's a real challenge because it takes practice and it takes a little work to to get those the finger, the muscle memory and all of that. Um, and and you have to be bad at it, right? You have to not yes. be good at it for a while, right? Anything that is that that requires significant skill that takes practice to develop, you know, it could be playing an instrument, it could be, you know, walking on two feet without falling over, you know, I mean, a lot of these different things, right? So, um, you know, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like really funny and, and snarky, but I, but I mean it, like, if you have to yeah. relearn to do those things as an adult, it is incredibly hard, or if you pick them up at the first time, for the first time as an adult, it's really hard. So, yeah, so for me as a teacher, a lot of my methods, um, you know, they, they derive from the way that kids learn things naturally. And uh, there's a lot of effort that I've put into developing curricula that uh, make it relatively low stress, I hope, to learn to spin so that it feels like play, it feels low commitment, and we do sort of movement-based things that build the blocks that are the building blocks of what you need to be able to do physically before you start really producing yarn. And it, it, it works out to actually get people producing yarn they're happy with inside of a few months and where people really have control over all of that kind of stuff. But it is hard because that's still a few months, right? So we're not going to be getting you a result today in the first 15 minutes that we do stuff. I mean, we will be getting you a result, but it may not be like what you dreamed it would be if if there's nothing there to set your expectations and how would there be if you haven't like grown up seeing people do this all around you and that kind of thing and and if all the yarn you've worked with is commercial that's different it, they have rollers and drafting machinery and stuff they don't mm -hmm. have fingers and it's just different it's a different product and i was going to mention for anyone who is in the crochet or knitting community whoever is purchasing yarn Take a look at where it's from because a lot of it is from Peru. So <laughs> someone mentioned uh, that they're spinning some Peruvian wool right now, which, yes, um, there's a lot of it that is kind of generally accessible through a lot of different um, yarn companies and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want to check the chat. Uh, the... A former classmate had their child with them, and you told them that it, their child was about the age that kids would have started to learn to spin. Yeah, and I think that's something else, too. We have a lot of um, parents or people with small children around them, you know, relatives, friends, neighbors, whatever. And uh, people are often like, oh, I can't do any spinning when the kids are around. And it's like, well, let the kids experience. Let them see. You know, obviously keep it safe. You don't want little fingers in fast turning spinning wheels. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think it's great for kids to see, especially to see us doing things that are just like relaxing, creative, enjoyable. I think that's important. We need to learn how to relax as well as mm -hmm. hustle. <laughs> 
you know, and, and it's interesting because there's there's this whole thing of thinking about how do we integrate those sorts of practices with our modern lives, right? And that is this whole that is this whole other part of stuff. And that is something that people are really actively doing because the amount of change that there has been in Peru in um in, in just my lifetime, and um I'm fifty-two, the amount of change that there has been in my lifetime is huge, right? Um, so people thinking about where these things that they learned to do as kids, but then they continued along to, you know, become dentists and doctors and lawyers and stuff like that. Where do they fit into their lives, right? Um, how How is this part of your lifestyle? And so now there's starting to be the idea that there can be doing fiber art stuff for leisure and that it is relaxing as well. And then, you know, people just don't like to have idle hands. Everybody wants to have hand fidgets. I'm sure nobody here understands that at all. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and then there's, and then there's like getting what you actually want. Right. Because, you know, if you go to, I don't know, H and M or whatever, you're not going to get exactly what you want. You know, you're not going to get, um, everything exactly right. So, so there's this expectation setting thing and there's this sense of, you know, well, where do these things fit in, in your life? And then we, we also have folks here now who are like 25 and they're like, I'm so sad that I didn't learn to do these things growing up. And my mom did, my dad did all of these kinds. We even see that like learning as an adult situation here, which is kind of interesting because I'm one of the only people that, you know, my whole social scene here knows who has focused on teaching adults these skills. That's very interesting. Isn't it? Isn't it? And yeah, it is. And we have a question about, we have a couple questions, but, um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to always leave that for encouragement that it's never too late to learn something new. And if you want to, go for it. I always say that. Totally. <laughs> it's true. Um, okay, so uh, Cindy says hi. Cindy took a class with you from Lambtown. <laughs> oh, cool. Lambtown's a great event. Uh, so let's see. Uh, we had another question about Vicuña. And let's let's talk for a minute about fibers. We're talking about spinning. Oh, let's talk about fibers. Let me, let, me just, let me just carefully move this and then... Just, I'm just going to sneak out of frame and I'll come right back. So start talking about fibers. Okay. So fibers. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of us are familiar with wool, but there are fiber producing animals in the Andes. And that includes alpaca, uh, llama, or the correct way to say it would be llama, right? Right. We don't say tortilla. We say tortilla. <laughs> Say bingo. Yama. There we go. I'm working on my Spanish and practicing so I can be ready. Obviously, there will be people who can translate and everything, so you don't have to learn Spanish if you go on a trip. But I want to anyway because I learned when I was younger. I want to refresh my things. So, and then we have alpacas, vi vicuña, and there's well, you can spin yama, but they're typically more pack animals. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, you do spin yama fiber, but, uh, but their fiber is more likely to be used for heavy duty, long wearing utility things like uh, potato sacks and ropes and all of that kind of stuff. So that's actually really important because you have to have those things. Um, you can't like not have ropes, right? But, uh, so, so yeah, so I guess I'll start with, I'm just going to pull out some chunks of fiber. I just happen to have this stuff sitting close by. This is some alpaca fiber. Um, and I'm going to show this color of the alpaca fiber because I think it is easier to see on camera and you can see it's kind of just a big mass. And this is what people usually spin the alpaca from is like a big mass. Let me try and pull out a lock or two here somewhere. So you can see a little bit of that and I'm going to pull off this lock and you can see it's a wow long staple fiber, all right. <clears throat> so it's pretty. I'm nice. like, ah, <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> so here's That's some gorgeous. here's some alpaca fiber, and it comes in a lot of different colors, like a lot of different colors. And so 
that's that's one bag. I just have a few of these things from uh, that are here instead of in my um, main studio in Ollantaytambo. And um, the thing with the South American camelids is there are four major kinds. And wild, before domestication, you had the vicuña and the guanaco. And it used to be thought that they were part of the same uh, the same whole family of yama based uh, of yama based animals, and that when they were domesticated, they were bred for different purposes from the yama. But now we know, um, thanks to around two thousand uh, different DNA analysis, uh, proved that alpacas were actually bred from the wild vicuña which is pretty cool. So they actually got a scientific name change and all that kind of stuff. And so they were bred to produce all these different colors. Like, look at this amazing deep black fiber. That's um, gorgeous. It's really gorgeous. And the, the, the fully black alpaca fibers, I mean, I wish there was like a way I could, I could make you feel it, but the fully black alpaca fiber is relatively rare even here um, and treasured. And then here's some of the white. And these came from these came from a friend's flock in uh, the town of Pitumarca, which is about three four hours from Cusco. And you can see these are pretty fine fibers, and they're very soft. And this is what they look like unwashed. The big thing is you'll see some dust. Alpacas like to roll in the dust, and uh, uh, well, you know, llamas do too, but not as much not as much as alpacas. Um, uh, alpacas are smaller and more fine boned than llamas, and um, and uh, there's there's just a lot of uh, a lot of different things about them. But they're they're pretty they're fine fiber. So uh, so there's that. So that's a lot to spin. This is what I happen to have, have with me. Let me show you this one other color. That's like so pretty. At least I think it's so pretty. Mm -hmm. Like, this is one of my favorite colors of alpaca. It's just so pretty. It's pretty. It's just anyway. So these are these are raw fibers in small quantities that I had for for doing a class. So I guess I've got these two different gray colors also, and um, and I all need of to that. pull out some of the alpaca stuff I've made. I've got things somewhere. <laughs> And so here is a here is a bit of uh, alpaca yarn. Let's try and get that in focus. Just a little bit, of it. and that's and that's fine. But <clears throat> but yeah, as it happens, it just so happens that some of my friends are spinners, weavers, and you know have animals. Just some, and um, I recently happened to pick up uh, from a friend who lives in a community that has vicuña, and vicuña were endangered and then protect, protected, and now there's, now there's, they're, they're in better shape now. But um, I was just demonstrating a little bit on this cute little spindle um, recently for a different class. But from my friend, I was able to score some of this amazing fiber. The real treasure of the Incas. The suspense! <laughs> are you in the suspense. suspense? I know the what you're about to show. The real treasure of the Incas, you know. And like, you, you can't get the, that's, that's close on my screen to the actual color, but I want to show a little bit about this and what this fiber is like. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to show you this chunk I have here that's got like some funky stuff in it somewhere in this bag because I had it for demonstrating for a different class, for showing to a class. Um, so I'm going to pull off a little bit, just a teeny tiny bit. I don't know if you can see how very fine this fiber is, but it has the world's like a finest. mist. Yeah, it has it has like guard hair that I don't know if we're going to be able to even focus in on and show on camera. Um, 
so you have to grab the, these guard hairs and pull them out. So let me even see that. I don't know. That guard hair is like the micron of the wool I usually spin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's like so fine. So you have to kind of grab it and pull out all these guard hairs by hand. Like you have to, you have to. And so then let's talk about what the staple of Vicuña fiber is. Okay. So in comparison to mm -hmm. that alpaca, and I'm, you know, I'm holding it up to my head for scale because we sort of know roughly what size a human head is, right? Um, and yeah, so so here it is. But look how look how fine it is, and I'll sort of drape this across my thumbnail and see if um, see if we can get it to focus that way a little bit. That's incredible. It's it's so fine. It's so fine. Wow. So in People the, are in, asking if you can purchase it. Is it you can. something that you it can is, purchase? It is now. It is now legal to purchase it, and and uh, and all that sort of thing. And so, um, I I bought this year two entire fleeces. Do you have plans for those? Other than yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up and them. making us I'm, troll. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna spin them. Um, so far, the only thing that I have done spinning any of it is I took a very small amount, and for a friend of mine uh, who had to go on a long trip, I made uh, uh, like an, an, an ancient um, Andean spinner's uh, sort of charm for safe travel, you know, and it's just like a little that. bracelet. Um, that is so cool. But, so, but we yeah, have. So yeah, you're you're all gonna get to, you know. Now, yeah, Vicuña I know. Are, I'm drooling. Vicuña are wild animals, and they don't breed in captivity, um, so they have to live out out in the wild. Let's see. I think maybe here we can kind of see what these guards. How do are. they? How do they harvest? Oh yes, I can see them. That's a good um, they are they are captured by people who temporarily captured by people who live in the communities that uh, and you can see that these are very fine guide, guard hairs. Um, but uh, they're they're captured temporarily and shorn, and you can't you can't you can only shear them at certain times of year and with lots of caution, and you can't shear them all the way down to the down to the, the down to the um, down to the skin because it gets really cold at high altitude. Um, and, um, yeah, and all of that kind of, of thing. Course. So mm -hmm. we have a few questions about the trip and I want to make sure that we answer those. We have a question about how much, uh, time we're spending on structured activity and how much time people have to chill out and We've, what that looks a like. That's a really so great question. Mention mm -hmm. a few activities mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of run through what we've roughed in as an itinerary, and um, and I'm not going to talk about what the backup activities are that we have, because there's a whole lot of them. Um, one of the things that is always a little bit challenging with planning, like, tour things is exactly this question of how much of it are you going to jam-pack full of activities, and are you going to give people any downtime to sort of process what they're doing and enjoy themselves and all that kind of thing? And one of the things that 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 Evie and I talked about was exactly this. And so we tried to make there be time in the evenings, every evening, for folks to sit around in the common areas or in the garden or go back to their room and just like, you know, introvert for a minute um, and and that kind of thing. Because I feel like when you don't give people any of the That people don't get as much out of the trip, right? So, um, so you know, it's like that's a bummer. So pretty much every evening has downtime because we're going to try to always be back before dark, and dark is generally speaking around six p.m. or give or take. Um, so then you have like your whole evening to do whatever you want. You can go for a walk, you can be social, you can do other kinds of things. And we also have a couple of rest days where we have not planned for people to be like going off and doing day trip kind of things. But so I guess, I guess I can start to describe um, when you tell me yeah. you're ready, if, we've, if we're, if we're clear with uh, um, questions right now. So yeah. So my, my uh, amazing facility is like a, a small hotel. It was a small backpackers hotel. And then we sort of 
fancied it up a little bit, um, you know, to, to be a little, a little bit more comfy. Um, cause not all of us are 19 year old backpackers anymore. Um, myself included. And, uh, so, so we, we, we did, we did all of that. And, uh, there are these comfortable private rooms with like nice windows and balcony areas and a, a huge, beautiful garden to sit in and a really nice indoor common area. That's like the living room and attaches to the dining room. So we've got the dining and living room area and it's, it's really, a, it's really a good get together kind of, kind of space. Um, so, so we do have all of that. And again, we are not even a kilometer walk from the main square in Ollantaytambo where you can go have like espresso drinks and an ice cream or go to a bar or do things like that, like if you want. So we try to make sure all your evenings are free, but we have those two rest days as well. And so you'll be staying there and that's where you're going to stay the whole time. So you'll check into your room, basically. You'll take your stuff, put it in your room, and we're just going to go out from there on day trips. So we're not going to be, like, traveling. Well, I mean, we're traveling, right? But we're not going to be, like, packing up all our stuff and going to the next town every other day or that kind of stuff. So it's a lot more It's a lot more chill. There's a lot more time to kind of uh, relax and, and do a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's, that's part of what we've, we've tried to build into things. And also we know that some people are morning people and like to have space in the morning. So we've tried to set it so that most of our activities leave after breakfast and breakfast is around 8 a.m. So there's a little bit of time for those who really enjoy mornings and sunrise is usually sometime between five and six and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's not like, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be, we're not like rushing you through a Disneyland ride schedule where you have to be certain places at certain times and stuff, even though, even though <laughs> yeah, no. we've got scheduled activities and stuff like that. But I think we've only got like two days where it's really, you know, we got to be on it. And one of them is going to, one of them is the day that uh, you can go to Machu Picchu, which is optional. And I'll come back to that. Uh, and um, and then another is the day when we're going to all participate in a die day. And we need to be, you know, because because of the volume of things that have to get done those particular days and because there are, you know, train schedules and things like that to think about, in, in those cases, yes, those days are pretty are pretty focused, let's say. Right. But for the most part, um, you know, we're going to have private, a private driver in a, in like a 20 passenger sprinter van to take us very comfortable to take us everywhere we're going to go. So we can literally be like, Oh my God, there's cochineal growing like mass quantities of it here on the side of the road where we are. Let's pull over and like squish some beetles. Um, and stain our hands bright red and and a lot of that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of this kind of flexibility. So now let me tell you what your days look like and how, how I usually do this kind of thing. Sound good. And, um, all right. So day one, we're going to schedule everybody to be arriving in the city of Cusco in the morning and we'll do an airport pickup. And then we're going to go straight to Ollantaytambo. Cusco is at 11,500 feet, which is high altitude. Ollantaytambo is at a little over 9,000 feet, which is considered moderate altitude. So usually it's better to acclimate at moderate altitude instead of being at high altitude right away. So if you can spend a few nights at um, moderate altitude before you go do any high altitude activities, people tend to do a whole lot better. And, uh, you know, we're also like right close to the emergency services that we've got, uh, that really, really good uh, private clinic, um, very close to where we are. So yeah, what we do is we pick you up and let's say we get, let's say everybody gets in 9 a.m., right? And by 9 a.m., we pick you all up, and then we're going to take a, a a sort of a slow and pleasant way route from the city of Cusco, where the airport is, down to the Sacred Valley, where Ollantaytambo is. And along the way, we're going to stop and pick up some fruit that you're really going to enjoy kind of snacking on. We're going to make sure everybody's got water to stay hydrated. We're going to get some really special bread that is uh, local to the Cusco area. And we're going to basically have snacks the whole sort of two hour ride through amazing landscapes and so forth. And my team and I will be monitoring you all for making sure nobody has any altitude issues or 
or, or everything. And then we're going to get to Ollantay Tambo and settle in for um, a light lunch that is going to be soup based. And then we're going to we're going to be hanging out at home, you know, at my place for the entire afternoon. And at that point, we will we will we will bring in some vendors and demonstrators who will show some stuff and we will give you a quick orientation to what a lot of the consumer and tourist products are and what the prices should look like and all of that kind of stuff and we'll tell you the truth right so that you're not going to be able to get scammed by somebody who's like and this is baby alpaca but it's actually synthetic and made in china because like that's the thing that potentially happens to to tourists when they come here, and so that's going to be it's really a rest day. But we've decided to bring in that educational and kind of uh, and 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 whatnot um, and whatnot kind of thing. And uh, so I want to throw in just a couple things real quick. Uh, that it is very. We had this question about how much is the is textile. We're very textile focused, but we're also in an incredible place and going to experience the local culture and you know these incredible uh archaeological sites and all of that so we're trying to have a good balance the between the and two the and the food of course no one will be hungry you promise no one will be hungry uh we also have a question about water about um, filter we have, yep we have a reverse osmosis filtration system so uh, you can get as much uh filtered water um as you want uh, where you, where you'll be living. And so that is, that is really handled. And there's also uh, really inexpensive while you're out and about, it's, it's really inexpensive bottled water pretty much everywhere. So, um, so you don't have to bring anything like a personal water filter, unless you really, really like bringing that, in which case we're not going to stop you, but, um, but, but you don't need to. We've, we've, we've tried to make it so that, um, well, so we actually had a lady, uh, on a trip this past this past year in May, whose luggage was separated from her at JFK Airport in the USA, and it took three more days to get to her, and so we quickly and she she literally had nothing. So we quickly, you know, I went out because uh, when we found out that her bag hadn't made it into the country and all that, um, uh, I went out and bought her some pajamas and like <laughs> t-shirts and some stuff just so that she would have a change of clothes and that kind of thing. But we literally have tried to make it so that um, if you just, you know, if you got dropped out of an airplane and landed here, you, you, you'd be fine. I mean, I don't think they're going to drop you out of an airplane though. I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, <laughs> Bring your parachute. <laughs> so, right, right, yeah. So right, we um, have, we're not then, quite that extreme. <laughs> We have another question about accessibility, and I want to address this one up front so everybody is mm -hmm. so everybody knows. Um, if you want to, yeah. Talk so about accessibility it. accessibility is 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 tough in Peru because Peru, on the whole, has not reached the level of accessibility outside of the city of Lima, which is on the coast, um, and even there accessibility is not something that uh, is necessarily at the levels that we see in a lot of the wealthier world. And this means that there are a lot of places that uh, are not wheelchair accessible, but they are like cane and walker friendly. And what people do here, because there are people in wheelchairs here, but what people do here is not necessarily comfortable for somebody who's coming as a traveler or a guest, right? Like they may not want to be picked up in their wheelchair and carried over some steps. Um, uh, but that is that is sort of the routine for people who are in wheelchairs here, and it's it's unfortunate, but uh, but it is what it is. Um, a lot of historical sites, archaeological sites, and so forth cannot be made wheelchair accessible. Um, like they can't. Like there's nowhere that you could put ramps. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's based around stairs, uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. So my particular facility, um, as long as you can, even if it's leaning on a shoulder or with a cane or holding the handrail, uh, go up or down up to five or six steps that are good, solid and safe steps, then, um, 
then then you can definitely do it. Um, when it comes to other forms of accessibility questions, those are bigger ones who we can answer like much more specifically um, about that kind of thing. But wheelchair access is sort of the big one that that people are usually referring to when when they ask about that kind of stuff. Uh, in other cases, people have um, limited mobility, and I myself sometimes have limited mobility. I have a hereditary knee problem, and I sometimes cannot walk without a cane, and so I'm very conscious of this question and you know as conscious as somebody can be whose apartment in Cusco is on the fifth floor with no elevator um you know there are times in my life when I just can't go to the Cusco apartment <laughs> um but uh you know but yeah it's uh it's it's really it really is it really is um challenging sometimes right like I'll just say like cobblestones with a cane can be can be tiring, but the specific place that my Ollanta Tambo hotel is, my guest facilities are, uh, is accessible by car, so the car can drive you right up to the door, drive into the area, and then you have to walk across some flat grass or gently sloping grass to get to uh, to get to where you have to go over a threshold to get into uh, your 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 bedroom. Um, so like. A lip like this there's a and and it's so all of that said we'll do our best and mm -hmm. abby will do her best and um you know if someone needs an arm to study or something mm -hmm. we'll do our best but sometimes it kind of just is what it is there so yeah so i can't like i can't like there are places i am not up to going anymore and those are not on our list all right. Uh, those are those. I generally I generally don't plan tour things with those things on the list unless I already know the people who are coming and what their mobility situation is like and um, and also their energy level. So one of the other things that happens is that uh, Peru, Cusco especially, is very focused. It's a very walkable place, which is great if you can walk and there is public transit and a lot of that kind of thing. And we're going to have drivers to take us everywhere we want to go. But um, like Peruvians tend to think of a short walk as being five kilometers. Right. So that's like two and a half miles. Um, so like, they'll be like, it's just right. It's Ayacito nomás. It's just right over there. And if, if somebody from Cusco says it's Ayacito nomás, it's like just right there. Like don't, uh, don't take that at like USA or European face value. Um, Got it. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> it could be only a kilometer away, but straight uphill. <laughs> yeah, right. They're up like flights of stairs that are a kilometer straight up, right? So, uh, so there's so there's stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, one thing I can say is before I take anybody on a trip, I go and with my team and we assess. Uh, whether or not I can do it on a bad mobility day or when, you know, one of my knees will not bend at all, or if I'm having some of my chronic pain flare up issues and we assess where there are good bathrooms, we assess what kind of food options there are, what kind of seating is available, how easy it is to get in there with a car, how much walking there is to get there. Um, and we, we work with everybody who, you know, we're going to partner with to make sure that they understand what's going on. Because like, it's also the case that a lot of people here have, uh, you know, grew up without uh, plumbing. And so for them, like going to the bathroom outdoors or using squat toilets is like no big deal. But if you have never in your life used a squat toilet, it's a big deal, right? Like, so, um, you know, I mean, yep. you may not physically be up to it, right? Like, like I say, when my knees are particularly bad, I'm not really up to using a squat toilet because, because, you know, knees, they're a thing. Anyway, yep. so, so that's, uh, so that, that's what there is to say, I think about, that's sort of the short answer about, uh, uh, accessibility. Um, <laughs> we have people who are up for it. <laughs> who are up for you really so want the experience. I'm sure it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. So I guess I want to say I want to say that uh, this experience is designed to be 
deeper and more real, right? So like there are a million tour operators that will put together sort of your classic thing where you're going to hit all the hotspots and get the Instagram selfies that you want. But what we want to do is make the trip of a lifetime that is really intimate and profound, right? Like where you really get to actually be here and experience it. So we're not going to be taking you to McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Like um, Starbucks is not on our list. Um, you know, that's, uh, right. that's, that's, that's what it is. But at the same time, we want it to be comfortable. Right. And, you know, like, I mean, let me be honest. I, I want to live a comfortable life, right. I want to have a really good hot shower with incredible high water pressure and stuff, which a lot of Peruvians don't care about as much. And I'm like, no, I want it to be like so hot that it's like a, a heated massage and people are like, that's extreme. And I'm like, yeah, but I want it. And, um, you know, and I mean, I if you're used to, to having to that too, it's more comfortable when, right. when I want to be able to, I want to be able to have ice in my drinks, you know? And so we only go to places that have filtered water ice, you know, and we have filtered water ice and things like that. I want to be able to, you know, have really good coffee. So there better be really good coffee. And, you know, I want to, so we're going to, we're going to Machu Picchu, but that one is optional because yeah, there is a lot of walking involved, and that's the main one that's like a big. Yep. yep. That is that is the big one that we cannot make any more accessible than. Uh, like two people carrying someone slung between them. Because places are even too narrow to get a wheelchair through in some cases. And so then they got to like go. So anyway, so it's not, um, I don't know. So Machu Picchu on anything that I organize is optional. And that's for two key reasons. And number one is accessibility. You cannot make it any more accessible than it is. Like if you want to get that, that postcard shot that everybody's got, that's like from your screensaver or, you know, uh, all of that kind of stuff, you absolutely have to go up a bunch of steps and mm -hmm. you, you cannot tour the site without going up and down steps. There's no other way. And so that is, so accessibility is a big reason. The other big reason is because it is the most expensive thing that you're going to do in the Cusco area. And, um, the most expensive thing you're going to do in the Cusco area. And for people who've gone before, they don't always want to go back because there are a lot of rules and limitations. You only get four hours at the site, for example. And so, you know, a train ride, even though it is a spectacular train ride, a bus ride, even though it is a spectacular bus ride, four hours at the archaeological site with a whole crowd of other people. I mean, with, you know, a thousand other people who are there at the same time as you. Um, and then a bus ride back down and a train ride back. Like, you know, it's it's, for some people, it's just really tiring and they don't feel the need to do it a second time. So I decided it's optional. And um, and so there there is an additional charge to go do that. And if you don't go do that, then you get a free day hanging out at my place and um, we'll do like a, like a cooking class, some food related uh, activities. And, you know, I don't know, depending on, depending on, uh, who specifically wants to be there, like maybe we'll bring in like a, a high-end fancy bartender to make like, you know, fresh fruit and fresh coconut cocktails and, and that kind of stuff. And you can lounge around in the hammock and yeah. So, you know, that sounds amazing it. too. <laughs> it doesn't what sound like What are bad, some of the, oh. right. What are some of the other things that we put on the list? I want people so, to know okay. about the rope bridge because yeah. I'm super so, excited about um, the rope so yeah. bridge. So yeah, so I do want to I do want to say we are going to spend the first few days in Ollantay Tambo taking it real slow and real easy to make sure nobody has any um, altitude issues and stuff like that, and making sure that we are close to you know emergency medical for anything that could come up and all that. And we are going to give everybody uh, an advanced medical form um, to fill out and so, and all of that kind of stuff, so that we know like what if you have any allergies or, uh, anything like that or any, like, you know, do you, do you have a pacemaker or something like that? So that if we do have to take you to our emergency medical services, we already have all that information and just hand it straight to, uh, the medical team there and we're good to go. Right. Um, and, um, and also that lets us have our medical 
advisors review things ahead of time and say, ah, I noticed that you're on this medication. You may want to talk to your cardiologist about X, Y, Z or something like that. I mean, I'm making that up, but, uh, but so just, just for things like that, just to make things better. So along with that, there are some things that, you know, there are some day trips that are longer day trips. And one of those is going to the rope bridge. And this is a suspension bridge that uh, was constructed um, for the first time during the Inca Empire as a fundamental part of the road system, the road system. Uh, and uh, it's made from grass rope and the whole community that maintains it still maintains it, has been maintaining it since Inca times and still does replace it every year. Well, okay. They did not replace it in 2020 because we were in quarantine and, and everyone couldn't go out and get together and replace it in 2020. So they replaced it in 2021. Um, uh, but they replaced, they, they rebuild it. It's, it's all rope that's made from grasses and made by hand. And it is remarkable. And Evie, I'm going to send you a video of me going across it and the whole thing. And my knees oh, were particularly awesome. bad. My knees were particularly bad uh, that day, so I didn't want to go up the other side, which is more stairs. So I actually went across it twice. There. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, uh, to be clear, though, do you consider rope a textile? I do. I do. I absolutely do. Everyone here does too. It's definitely a textile. And I think, you know, when, when we go and see this bridge, you're, you're going to be like, this is so amazing. Like I, you know, because it's, it's rope and we're not talking about like just a simple rope. These are compound ropes and complex structures and everything. And, and it's, it's braided in some places and, uh, and we're going to talk about what the words mean. So the name of that in Quechua is Eswachaka. And Eswa means rope, twisted rope, with things that have twisted around each other, then they are Eswa. And Chaka means bridge. So that is the twisted rope bridge and and all of that. But it's got some things that are also, you know, more woven-y that are parts of it and that kind of stuff. So it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. It is pretty spectacular. Well, and then the landscape getting there is amazing yeah. also. And... Um, and so we'll we'll take a we'll take a special route through there. I think we can probably actually even go through this place that a friend of mine just took me that I didn't know was there, and it was like really cool to get out of the car and look at it. But we we went out we went out to visit, and we're on, on the way back, and he said, "Oh, did you know if we go down this route, there's this whole canyon of fossilized coral?" And I'm like, did you just, it's "Fossilized coral?" And you know we're at twelve thousand feet above sea level, right? So I'm like. That would have to be like really old. And he's like, it is, it is really old. You want to go that way? And I'm like, yeah. So we went that way and you know, it's, and it, it is, it's like a, a, an old Canyon of 300 million year old fossilized coral. Like. It's incredible. I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> like that's like, it's so, so there's going to be like all these interesting things and it's just, um, there's just, there's just a lot of stuff where you're like, Wow. So then, I mean, like people talk about, people talk about in English, they call it Rainbow Mountain here. It's called Bini Kunka. That's its name. But it's, there's been this big advertising push to send people there. And the reason that you can see all the different colors of dirt on that particular mountain, which is at uh, like 16,000 feet. So it's high enough altitude to be concerning. And it's an entire day trip to go see that. And there are no emergency medical facilities, and it's dangerous and risky. In fact, somebody died there being struck by lightning four days ago. Um, so, I, so it's not on my list because it's dangerous and because I don't think it's actually that cool, but people are like, it's the Rainbow Mountain. Like everywhere in, in Peru, in the Andes, is Rainbow Mountains because there's so much different mineral content. All the dirt is different. So everywhere is spectacular scenery and, and all that kind of stuff. And most of the Instagram pictures you see people have like really bumped up the saturation and all this kind of stuff. So it's one of those. If like, anyone uh, wants to learn that, I'll show you when we're down there. <laughs> pointing out things that we drive past that are really spectacular and stopping at amazing viewpoints and places where you're going to get 
uh, where you're going to get to have group pictures or pictures taken that are not the ones that everybody else has, right? So not available in green screen mode um, and a lot of that. So, so yeah, that's so, so incredible. We won't need to turn up the saturation. You to will have not it look cool. <laughs> so the, the pictures that I post, you know, I don't, I like, I will crop. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I may like, if they're from like low light conditions, um, I may, I may, uh, you know, lighten them a little bit, but I don't do a lot of fiddling with those photos and stuff like that. And sort of towards the end of, towards the end of this, um, you know, I'll, I'll see if I can, if I can share some stuff, but I don't know if I can, but so I'll send stuff to Evie anyway to, Look at all of that. So anyway, so we're going to be going in addition to the rope, the rope bridge. The rope bridge is we've got that in week two in, in the second week. So I'll just run through our itinerary that we laid out. And a lot of things in the itinerary are scheduled to be are subject to being flipped from one day to another, depending on various things. Right. You know. Um, so, so there's always, there's always the chance when you plan something like almost a year ahead of time, that when you actually get right into the date, it turns out that you can't do it on that day and you have to move something from Tuesday to Wednesday or swap Tuesday with Wednesday and that kind of thing. So, um, so our itineraries, I do want to stipulate are subject to those kinds of changes, but we're going to get all of these things in there. So day one is a rest day. Day two is walking around Ollantay Tambo, which is the living Inca city, which is full, which is itself an archaeological site. You are going to be staying in an archaeological site, but in a comfortable place. So like when you look out your window, you're going to be looking at like the amazing granaries, the Inca granaries where they stored grain and at the main fortress and stuff like that. Um, and uh, day number three, we've scheduled for a cultural activity to be determined. We haven't decided which cultural activity that's going to be because once we have uh, sort of a quorum signed up, we're going to tell you what the three options are and let everybody vote. So you even have some say in what that ends up being. And by cultural activity, this could be like going to see some traditional dancing, going to learn a traditional dance. This could be learning how to cook a traditional meal. It could be going to, uh, going to see some agriculture in progress and maybe participate. It could be getting a language lesson. It could be getting a spinning and weaving lesson. It could be a lot of different things, but we're going to let you know, um, you know, once we know that we have a quorum of people and let, let those folks uh, vote on what it's going to be. Day four is the optional Machu Picchu or lounge around and relax day. Uh, day five, we're going to go to Mara Mine, kind of, except um, what it is, is it's where there is a salt river that comes out of the hillside. And uh, about 4,000 years ago, they built terraces to accumulate there and to filter and evaporate so that salt piles up and everybody who lives in those communities in that one particular community has like a terrace that they can go work and all this kind of stuff and so we're going to get to go and see it and um and look at these amazing salt terraces that uh that have been producing salt for at least four thousand maybe five thousand years and that people still do it the traditional way. And that's pretty remarkable. We're also going to go to Morai, which is uh, often discussed as being an, um, an agricultural lab because it's these giant round circles. And then you kind of drop down, drop down, drop down. And so it funnels cold air down. Um, the truth is nobody knows for sure exactly why it's there or exactly what it is. And the agricultural lab is one of the theories. And then some people are like, there's no way that's what it was. And then other people are like, yaha. And then people are like, must be aliens. And it was not aliens. It was not aliens. It was pre-Columbian people. But anyway, so those are some spectacular things. And some of the terrain around there is also really amazing. And then we're going to go um, from there to a uh, to a, a, a weaving demonstration, to a weaving center where they'll demonstrate spinning, weaving, dyeing, all of this kind of stuff. And, um, and you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, then we're going to go back, rest up real good. And on day six, we're going to go do the Cusco City tourism kind of stuff and everything. And then day seven is uh, a Cusco free day, and folks who are leaving, who are only there for the seven-day thing, will will fly out, and we'll have like a farewell lunch kind of thing and that sort of thing. So that is that is week one. So that there's a lot in week one. Now, 
week two is when it gets much more intensive. And that's because you've been at altitude for longer and a lot of that kind of stuff. And so we wanted to make sure that if folks can only come for one week, that they have a really good eclectic experience and are able to go home and, you know, your friends are going to be like, well, did you see Machu Picchu? Yes. Well, did you do this? Well, did you do well, what? You know, you don't want to go home and be like, all we did was like eat amazing food and talk about traditional dress and like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, in the garden okay. spinning, but <laughs> you know, that might be okay. But, uh, but we tried to make, we, we tried to sort of break it up a little bit that way so that you wouldn't be missing out on a lot of these really key things. So day eight after our, you know, day in Cusco um, and saying farewell to those who have to leave on day seven, uh, day eight is natural dye day. And, we're going to get up early in the morning and we're going to go to the facility where we're doing the natural dyes and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to work. We're going to work. I mean, if, if you don't feel up to running around and throwing yarn in boiling pots of brightly colored water, that's okay. Cause you can watch and other people will do like a whole lot of the work, but if you want to be doing it, you can be as involved as you want, as active as you want. And you still get your, we're, we're probably going to do seven colors. Seven colors is a lot for one day, but we're probably going to do seven colors. And when we get towards the end, Evie, remind me and I'll bring over a, a, an example of what those colors are. Cause I have, I have, across the is room. It, I have one right here. Oh, do you? Is it? Yep. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, so like so like those those kinds of colors. Those kinds of those those kinds of colors. I was gonna bring over I've got a bundle of skeins in each of the seven colors that we've Oh yeah, for sure. So yeah. I will definitely so remind me to bring that over, but I'm not gonna like go push the camera out of the way for right now. Uh, I'm gonna finish this up. So then anyway, after our big heavy push and die day and everything, day nine is rest and like work on projects that we've picked up because as we as we're going through everything in uh you know starting on day one everyone's going to get a spindle we're all everyone's going to get to have to have some fiber and some basic stuff and we're going to give some general lessons and you'll have your carry around projects to work on throughout stuff and so anyway day nine is rest and projects and then day 10 we're going to go visit a weaving community we're going to go visit a spinning and weaving community and meet people in it and that's when you're gonna you're gonna see like a lot more about what people are wearing and all this kind of stuff so because of that we have scheduled day 11 to be our deep dive on costume and communication and talk about a lot of uh, a lot of the things that people want to know like how are the different elements of stuff made do you weave all of these things do you sew all of these things uh do tailors make them who does the embroidery what are the structures in the different garments do they have significance are they practical what do they mean um you're going to get to wear and try on a lot of these clothes and if you want we can even make it possible for you to buy and do some of the working on these clothes yourselves because we know that uh we know that evie's audience is um and then then we're going to the rope there's bridge. more yeah and then and then and then on, <laughs> on, on day 12 we're going to the rope yes we're going to the bridge the bridge and then we're going to come back from the bridge we're going to get like a good night's sleep. We're going to rest up real good and all of that kind of stuff. And we are going to pack up and head out from Ollantaytambo and go to Cusco and settle into a hotel that we're going to stay at overnight in Cusco. And the day 13, we are going to do we are going to do museums in Cusco. There are some pretty spectacular museums. So we are going to go to the Cori Cancha, which is the fabled court of gold, which is a, it's a, it's um, a Dominican convent now, but it was the heart of the Inca empire. And it is spectacular. It is absolutely amazing. Like, I mean, you know, I go there all the time to look at all the different things. There are there are incredible paintings, there are textiles, there's architecture, there's historical stuff, there's there's carvings, there's, you know, tons of gold and I mean literally gold, you know, uh and yeah, just just amazing stuff. We're going to do all of that and then we're going to have a farewell dinner. Uh, that night, and then on day fourteen, um, we'll run you we'll run you around, like tire you out in the morning. Going to do all your last souvenir shopping for anything you haven't gotten to pick up and everything, and then you'll 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 pack up and head to the airport, and 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 that's it. 
it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> so I want to uh, mention a couple of things. I have some info. I pinned a post, so you can go see my Patreon post there. I will continue to post things on my Patreon, and they will be public, and they will be open for everyone to see. Uh, we don't have the sign-up yet. There is information about a deposit to hold your space and all of that, so we'll have those details all written out. Um, I don't want to just like say stuff right now because I want to make sure it's written. You can reference it and see what all of that is. I also want to say that coming up to the trip, when we have people who are signed up and getting ready to go, we are going to do some Zoom calls so that we can answer those questions about what should you pack, what do you need to bring, what don't you need to bring, um, all of those kinds of very specific things to make sure that you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, what else am I missing? The signups are not open yet. They will be. And I will announce everywhere when they are. Uh, but people who have been my active patrons get first pick. So, um, and if we sell out the trip, we'll have a waiting list. And if we fill up the waiting list, we'll do two, two trips. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's that's sort of the nice thing about um, about Evie and I partnering on this whole thing is that we actually have that latitude. You know, we can yeah we can make that happen. But we also we've also um, worked hard to make group size be comfortable because, like, if you're if you're traveling with forty people. It's a lot, not only in terms of what that you have to handle from a logistics standpoint, but you feel like you're, you know, but to go on that trip, it, it's a lot, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of a lot of different kinds of travel. I have taught large groups of people. I've taught medium-sized groups of people. I've handled logistics and a whole lot of different things. And, oh, that reminds me, I should probably tell you a little bit about my team. Um, just real quick. There's we have a quick question. How many people are we going to max? What's the max for our number of people? It's not 40. We're much smaller. No, no, no. I think we're we're looking at fifteen to sixteen, depending. Um, is is what we're is what we're looking at. Uh, so this is going to be a much smaller group, so that, like, you know, we can get a restaurant table, if we, <laughs> that that fits in a yeah. restaurant. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's 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 what we're looking at for for sizes. And if we fill that up, we'll do it a second time. You know, uh, but yeah. So that's that's what we're looking at. And um, your team. And my team. My team, well, there's me. And uh, then there's my BFF, Marta. And she and I have known each other since we were like six, and, since we were six and eight years old. And uh, so we've known each other a long time. And she is a, she is a household and hospitality manager. And so she... Uh, so she is in charge of making all of the logistics for our home stay and everything happen. And she will be cooking all of our traditional meals, including adapting them for different dietary considerations and dietary needs. She's very good at doing that. Um, I should, I should mention that I am diabetic. And so she has to adapt a lot of things for me if I want certain kinds of things and whatnot. And, um, and her assistant is uh, is uh, her son Piero, my nephew, because Marta is like my sister. And her assistant is just finishing culinary school. Um, uh, he's got one semester of culinary school left, and then he is a like licensed chef, and he is trying to decide what he's going to do as far as starting his own restaurant. Uh, um, starting in 2025, and so he's going to take that kind of after this upcoming semester, he's going to take. Uh, uh, the better part of a year off working just for his mom doing a variety of different kind of things um, and all that. So we have, we have two main cooks and chefs and Manuel is uh, Marta's husband and he was an Inca trail porter and then he was an Inca trail cook. And then he was a general uh, manager of cooks for all kinds of treks and adventure travel. So like he was the guy that, um, was the guy that towards the end of it, uh, towards the end of his career doing all this kind of thing that, uh, got hired to run all the logistics surrounding food and equipment for filming things in Peru, like survivor man Peru. He was the main logistics guy for, cause all the crew has to eat, you know, um, right. 
<laughs> and they have to get their equipment in and they have to be able to set up and they have to have electricity and they have to have, you know, like all of that kinds of things, all of that kind of, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and, and yeah, so, so he is our logistics, uh, our main logistics coordinator and physical plant coordinator. And he knows people in like just about everywhere we're going to go and, uh, and a whole lot of that kind of stuff. And then there is Jocelyn and she is, uh, she is our, uh, MBA in hospitality person. And she is actually, she is, uh, well, I call her my left hand for two reasons. Number one, my left hand is the one that has carpal tunnel in the wrist and some other, and the curvains and other sorts of things. And also she's left-handed. So like it just, you know, I have, I don't need a right hand. I need a left hand. So, um, you know, very, very funny. Right. But she is, she is in training to be my executive replacement and all that so that someday I can retire. Uh, and she, uh, she goes along with me to just about everything that I do and when when we have uh, when we have people here visiting and doing experiences and so forth, she is our chief problem solver. Who isn't me? Um, so I can say, all right, um, you know, we 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 need some of that like padded stuff for blisters. What is it called? You know, and she'll like, I gotcha, and she just goes and handles it and comes back. And um, awesome. And if we have to like split up for any reason, you know, or so like, you know, when you're going in groups, you have to have one guide who goes up front and then somebody who is sort of the tail sweeper and make sure that nobody uh, accidentally takes a wrong turn and stuff like that. So we have, um, we have, and so she is, she will, she trades off with me on those kinds of details. And so these are, these are my team and they are also my family as it happens. Cause in Latin America, everybody's got family businesses and, and works with family and whatnot so i can't honestly i can't wait to meet them too because i've said hi so many times since they've come in the background when we've been chatting <laughs> i'd love to actually get to meet meet them and, <laughs> so and they're, they're all really really great folks they're 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 a really great crowd we may have some other people who you will also get to meet in zooms like coming up to coming up to the trip and so forth because you know as we get closer to it and stuff and we finalize and we firm up like who's going to be driving what van, right? Then, then we go from there. We have a question about who can go on the trip. If you can get an airline ticket to Peru and you can go to Peru, you can go on this trip. So yep. Um, yep. make sure your we passport also, is good. Yeah. So, okay. Two things, two things about this. Um, when you're looking for flights, I recommend looking for flights from wherever your nearest airport is direct to Cusco, but also look at flights to Lima because if there's more than a $300 difference, if a flight direct to Cusco is more than $300 more expensive than a flight to Lima, then just buy the flight to Lima and let us help you find a flight from Lima to Cusco that, that works with it because, um, because they're generally much cheaper to buy from within Peru and we can provide some logistical support to that. We also are able to help assess whether an itinerary that you're considering is, is, is rational and makes sense and stuff like that. And the other thing to know is that we do have the possibility potentially depending on what things look like. Like for example, um, I have somebody who's come on a number of trips who comes from Switzerland and where the flights are coming through, uh, sometimes it has been more convenient for her to come a day or so ahead of time. And we do have the option to add uh, days beforehand or afterwards to make things more economical uh, in terms of flights. So those are, so don't like finalize your flights until you've had a chance to talk to Evie and myself about, about some of that kind of stuff. So that, because we do, we do sort of provide support about that. The other thing is Peru has as a very firm requirement that you have to have at least six months of time on your passport from the point when you enter Peru. Okay. So that means if you have a passport that will expire before, um, April of 2025, so six months after October, then you should work on renewing it, especially if you are in the USA, because passport renewal times right now are running three to four months. And I'll, I'll, I had that, I had those dates off, so I'll do an update and make sure I clarify exactly what that is and make sure everybody mm -hmm. has that info as well. Um, 
group deal on tickets, like if a bunch of people are coming from a specific airport in the United States, say everybody flies out of O'Hare? Um, maybe. In some cases, in some cases, yes. But since COVID, it's been a lot harder to actually get those. Um, so that is, if, if we do have like at least six people coming from the same airport, um, then let me know and I can talk to some travel agents I know and see what they can work out if there is something they can work out. Um, but those have been harder to come by since, since COVID. So we'll do our best to get everybody there as economically as possible, as comfortably as possible. And it's going to be an amazing, amazing really time. Is. I am so excited. I can't wait. Mark is coming too. So if anybody wants to hang out and laugh because Mark is hilarious, I'll be there too. <laughs> well, okay. And so like, here's, here's another thing is like, um, you know, in the past we've had people where like one, where like one person was really interested in all of the textile stuff and in doing Peru tourism. And then their spouse is like, I'll, you know, I guess I'm interested in going on a vacation, but I don't know if I really care about going to a die day or whatever. And we, we do have the possibility to, you know, uh, send a spouse who really doesn't want to go on a dye day out whitewater rafting or to the distillery for the day or something. Right. Um, there, these are these options, but what we've usually found is that once people get here, there's enough that's interesting about the things we're doing and the settings we're doing them in that even the non-fiber spouses are like, yeah, no, I, I really want to go along and do that. So, um, so there's, there's, there's a whole lot there. I mean, you can, you can look at it. Um, you can kind of look at it from the perspective of uh, a lot of tours and I would call this an experience more than a tour, but a lot of tours just want to like hit the things that you're supposed to see and get your Instagram photos of and so forth. And, you know, we're trying to provide a deeper experience and like let you actually really be here. Cause um, like we're, we're specifically looking at uh, talking to the market of folks who know what they're interested in right and and um and a lot of that kind of stuff so uh the the 18 person cap that that's like that's like how many beds there are so we can't increase that if it's if it's spouses that would be two spots i think that's the question um yeah so um yeah, basically, basically that's that's based on how many beds there are, how many bed spaces there are at the uh, uh, at 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 my place. So we and the other thing is we 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 can't really go above that number of people and still expect to fit in vehicles that are going to go to the places that we want to go. So we're not going to take a forty passenger bus on some roads. We're just we're, we're not. So, um, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, but, you know, sometimes, but. Bring your spouse or your family or things like that. Um, but, uh, but we also, you know, um, if your whole, if you're coming with your whole family and they're not all, into fiber activities and whatnot, we can, we can talk about other things because really we wanted to center this around Evie's audience, right? So people who are into fiber and costume, because there's so much. And people here. who have mm -hmm. a level of awareness, right? Because there's a different way that you're going to explain things. If it's somebody who has never spun a fiber in their life versus mm -hmm. someone who has, even if, they've only used an e spinner. They still have a lot of information yeah. just in their mind about how that all works and what that looks mm -hmm. like. And so it's, it's exactly definitely. Right. And, and like, you know, and like somebody who has no interest in fiber whatsoever is not going to be interested in having somebody come over, bringing each of these different kinds of camelids and talking about different things that they do. And, and, you know, uh, uh, somebody who isn't interested in fiber is not going to be that enthused by a spinning and weaving demonstration and might rather go to a beer tasting or something. Right. So when we're selecting what activities we're going to do, there's, there's stuff about that. I mean, I also do 
experiences that are related to other kinds of things. But this is Evie's cool trip. And so, you know, she and I have been talking about this and brainstorming about this. And she has asked for things and we've talked about things that are not on my general list, right? Because because I know that people who follow her and who are her patrons on Patreon and all that kind of stuff um, are interested in the things that you're interested in, right? So so that's a special opportunity for me too to put together something that is different and and all of that. I mean, obviously, like I, I I do I do experiences for lots of different things like that, but this is a chance to come along with me and Evie while she and I delve into like her specific interests on what she wants to know more about. Yes, and it's going to be amazing. And if you can't make it or if uh you know for whatever reason i will be doing a video there will be pictures there will be all of that but this is going to be the trip of a lifetime so if uh if it is something that you can or are wanting to do it's it's going to be incredible so abby i want to thank you for our time we've been going for a while here and i don't want to keep you all day but do tell us where can people find you if they want to uh take a lesson from you or check out your stuff um, yeah, Share sure. Away. Um, sure. Uh, you can find me at abbeysyarns.com with no apostrophes or anything in it. You can That's my website, and there are links there to uh, lots of different things, to, um, to, uh, to, well, to lots of different stuff. And actually, there, I have some specials right now, and today's the last day to order for anything that's going to arrive in time for Christmas in the USA, um, where, like, if you buy a spindle, any spindle, then you get my spinning one class for free. Uh, and that's also good as a, a gift type of thing. Like if you want to indoctrinate someone else, suck them into, you know, just pull them down the rabbit hole into, into it's fun. <laughs> it's, right? um, so that's, so that's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, and there, there's some specials and, and stuff that are, that are there right now. And, uh, Evie, I'll send you some links to that. There's, uh, there's, there's, uh, you can see them on my Instagram. Um, also, I am Abby's Yarns pretty much everywhere on social media, like pretty much everywhere except Threads, because um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna go to Threads, um, uh, but everywhere else. Uh, uh, so Abby's Yarns, and if you can spell my name, you can find me. I actually had a friend uh, who lives here about a week ago say, man, have you ever thought about like how much it would be like a drag if everybody like knew all this stuff about your life and like they could just find it on the internet? And I was like, <laughs> so you've never Googled me, have you? And he was like, no, why would I? You do have that? a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I was like, well, so I the link to the Wikipedia page, right? And he was like, awkward. <laughs> Like, yeah. You know, what yeah. happened to your sister? And I'm like, right. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, it was it was totally it was it was that was that was a very funny moment, right? Because we we're in a group of people, and like I didn't know that guy very well, and so forth. And he was talking about some some musician here that like some story had just come out about uh about like all his sort of love affairs or something and everyone was like watching it on YouTube and the whole thing is like, how much would that suck? You know, have you ever thought about, and like you looked directly at like at me and was like, have you ever thought about what it would be like if people could just find you all over the internet? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, if you can spell my name, uh, you can Google me and, it, and, and you will find me. But, um, but yeah, right now uh, there are specials published on Instagram um, that are easy to find and, uh, and abbeysyarns com is my website and that links to all the other things. And there are lots of ways to interact with me, lots of ways to interact with me. Um, cause yeah. I like people. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Abby, <laughs> thank you so, so much. And if anyone has questions, feel free to leave them as comments. Um, and we, you know, I'll scoop those up and we'll, I'll type up mm -hmm. some answers and we'll uh, get things I'll, you know, we want to just communicate and make sure everybody knows what's up and what's going on and keep an eye out for the announcement when the signups, I will pre-announce it. It won't be like a, oh, things are, you know, oh, things are up now. No, I'll give you a, uh, uh, you know, it's going to go up on this day and I'll give you like a week. Heads up or something. And we're looking so. at sometime in January, I think, right? So. 
Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, because we have to get things set up for all that. So anyway, I just thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And I will see you all in the next one, except this is technically a vlogmas video, and we have to give everyone a blessing. <laughs> What's the blessing? <laughs> what should it be, Abby? Do you have something for us? Just a well wish of fiber. Um. Yes, well, so here in the Andes, we always ask Pachamama, who is Mother Earth, and the Apus, who are the mountain spirits, to uh, to to share with us. And so we always uh, share food and water with them and drinks and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and we say thank you for providing us with everything that we need for life. And uh, so thank you for the air and the water and the uh, and the animals that provide us with fiber and keep us warm and for the rain and the crops and the harvest and everything like that. And uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere, we are coming into summer. So for those of you who are in the Northern Hemisphere, I'd like to send uh, some really nice summer vibes to get you through December. <laughs> I think that's the best Vlogmas blessing we've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. All right. Well, happy spinning, everyone. And I'll see you in the next one.